Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of, uh, so one of the issues with Google is it's really hard to like search for equations and whatnot, so I was thinking of just writing a, a quick app to kind of look for similar equations. It would probably have to connect with an online database that could probably also do with a local database using SQLite or something. Um, I don't think there's SQLite available. I mean, you might need to do some investigation. Something like that. Okay. It has to exist. All right. Yep, go ahead. I'd like to make a uh, just a simple contact us form that allows you to besides take the data and save it for each of the different uh, fields, but also upload a video and connect it to Google. Uh, upload a video. Upload a video. So take a video on your phone and upload mm -hmm. it. To? You could go to Drive. I think that's going to be the easiest um, integration to You post. will have to look up the API of Google Drive and see how that works. I'm pretty sure you, know, you can format that in a, as a post in a request, but the exact details is going to be the, that's going to be the difficult part. Yeah, I've done the contact us form on Google App Inventor, but uh, connection of video, okay, or photos even it doesn't have to be video, but photos, okay, and then the storage of those in some Google uh, post posting area, whether okay. that be I mean there's a few different options because it does tie into the fusion tables. Yeah. But, so I mean, you can't store stuff in there. But. Yeah, the Fusion table last time I checked uh, was not very secure because you know it's not your own Fusion table. It is a Fusion table that is already set up by the developer of um, App Inventor. So you might need to kind of check on those things first. So when we get to that point, we will we'll take a look. Um, I just want to point out that I did upload the video this morning, but I was not able to get to it until this morning because my home internet connection was out entirely and I did not feel that I would use, I want to use my phone to tether to my computer to upload like a massive amount of stuff. So because I'm still about two weeks from uh, the cycling, <laughs> I don't want to use up all the bandwidth just yet, okay? Um, but anyway, you know, I finished the transcoding. Uh, it is up at this point. So we have the 0822 you know, class lecture and the 0822 lab on uh, uh, YouTube already. So you guys can watch that. Uh, I double check the audio is good. Everything seems to be working. All right. So any questions about this part? Any questions? All right. Well, this just occurred to me. You know, I'm not sure whether you guys want to do this or not. Um, one thing you can possibly do is to do a 3D um, type of app where you can take a picture from one location, take a picture of the same thing from another location. And you know, just do the um, uh, projection, you know, as a 3D thing. Um, I'm not really sure whether uh, App Inventor has enough, you know, horsepower to shift the images so that it would align just right. I'm pretty sure it can do a part of that, but you know, how much it can do is kind of a question. But that can be kind of cool, you know, if you have one of those uh, Google is it called the the card box? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the one that folds up using card box. Um, I think it's just Google card box, Card right? Cardboard. Cardboard, okay, that's it. Um, I have one of those at home. You know, it's, it's, it's easy. I mean, it's cheap um, and it does work. Um, I know, you know some of the fancier ones now have a fan blowing you know, to make sure that your phone doesn't overheat and melt down and kill itself, that sort of thing. But, you know, just an idea. I mean, it's, it can be kind of cool. Um, and on top of that, don't forget that you, you can use um, a canvas, and inside the canvas you can have animation. So if you have two canvases, or can buy, I guess, um, and you know have animation that is coordinated, you can actually start to see objects, you know, like you know, going further and further away, getting closer and closer, and stuff like that. That could be that could be fun. Yes. So we have access to the full HTML5 canvas and whatnot. No, no, this is not a HTML5 canvas. This is a canvas inside App Inventor. So it's kind of like a really special kind of uh, container where you can have sprites and things that can move on their own. So we'll, we'll get to that you know, at some point as well. <coughs> All right, so getting back to this class, you know, the recorder should be recording. It is recording. And it is recording from the correct channel. I always have to check 
because sometimes I don't check this and it's recording from the internal sound part of the computer which is not connected to anything so it won't be recording any sound at all you'll be watching a silent movie <laughs> which is not going to be helpful so I just need to double check make sure everything is good all right so I, I want to point out a few things uh, resources that is already on Moodle um, I'm hoping most of you not all of you have done the interactive syllabus already, so you can see the rest of the content on this website. Um, this is a project idea notebook. It is not something that I am going to grade. This is a resource for you to keep track of your own ideas. Okay. So when you have an idea of a project, when you want to add to your ideas, you know, this is just one, one way for you to keep track of your own project ideas. Okay. You don't have to turn in anything. I'm not going to read it. You know, it's all up to you to decide how you want to use that resource. Yes? Will we have access to that after the class or not? Um, after this class, you mean at the end of the semester? Yeah. Like, is it something that I will keep it around until the next class starts because okay. I recycle my classes. So at the end of the semester, you probably will want to just copy and paste it into a Word document or something else. Okay. But during the semester, you know, it is yours. Okay? You know, nobody else in the class can see it. It is enti entirely yours. Um, okay. So are there any questions about um, that resource? I can click on it and you can just see what it looks like. Um, it's, it's a wiki page, you know, it's easier to link your document to other, some other documents. Um, what you need to do is really just use HTML, create page, and here is just an HTML editor where you can type anything you want, anything that is capable in um, HTML, um, and it's just a way for you to document, you know, how you want to do your projects, ideas of your projects, and you can change it as time goes on. I am not going to read it. I won't hold you accountable for stuff that you write here. Okay, so you can say, you know, I want to make Pokemon Two, Pokemon Go Two. You you can you can do whatever you want. Okay, it is entirely just a place for you to park your ideas. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Question: When this project is due? This project is due at the end of the semester. Before final or? Well, I would, I would give you guys until the last day of the semester, so it is going to be due after the final exam. Oh, even after. Even after, but you know, don't, don't try, don't procrastinate. Okay, no, when, just, when I give people more time, you, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's not a good thing. Yeah, you will have two midterms and one final exam, and then one final project. Where on the scale on the calendar? Well, the, the first exam is going to be about one third through the semester. You know, I can I never really know exactly the exact date. About one third. Um, so it will be about since it's, it's a sixteen week semester now, so it's going to be about week six or so, and then the other one's going to be about week ten, week eleven or so. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is that page because I don't really have anything to type here. Um, um, moving on to development platform, you know, this is something that we talked about last time. So have you guys decided how you want to develop your app? Bring your own laptop computer, have an external hard drive so I can give you the Linux distribution. Have you guys kind of decided? I see a lot of people with that laptop computer, so you guys should be okay. And do you want to use a virtual device? Yep. Uh, I have my laptop computer, but the Android device that I'm using, uh, I, I need to wait for like a week or two before I can get it. You'll be fine. You know, you can use a you can just use a, a virtual Android device for the time being. Um, it looks kind of clunky, but it does work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other issues? I could do like a combination of the lab computer and my laptop if I wanted to, right? Since it's all online with the MIT thing. Correct. Um, in other words, you know, any place you sign in, you will have your project back. The the big question is, are you going to use a virtual device or not? If you want to use a virtual device and you use a lab machine, that's not a very good combination because we cannot install. Um, they call the uh, they call it the AI setup software on those computers. So that's the only tricky part. 
but your project is on in the cloud. I mean, you know, anywhere anywhere you sign in, you have you, you have your project back. Okay. Any other concerns or issues about you know how or what equipment to use to develop your apps? Yep. So, so App Inventor comes with an emulator, right? It comes with an emulator, but the emulator cannot be run entirely through the browser. So you do have to install a little bit of software on the PC first. And they do have that software for Windows, for Mac OS X, and also for Linux. The problem with the lab machines is they are locked down, so we cannot install that software on those computers. So that's the only issue. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions. Very good. All right. So we are pretty much done with internet access and Google account. It's really just outlining what you need to, uh, to do homework assignments in this class. Uh, a project to consider, okay, we just, we talked about that quite a few times already. Um, so we are ready to move on to introduction to mobile devices. Yes? Is there a deadline for the proposal? A deadline for? For the project proposal? Um, it's not even assigned yet. So you guys, so this, it's, you, it, it's up to you to decide what you want to do now because there's no particular due date just yet for that project. So I just want you to start to think about it, look at App Inventor, find out you know, what components are available, and then use that to help you decide, okay, this is what I want to do, does it seem doable to me, okay? Because when you turn in a project proposal, I will take a look at that, and then I will give you some feedback as well. So moving on to introduction to mobile devices, um, we are going to talk about mobile devices, examples of applications on mobile devices, and so on. All right, so before we even go into this, I just want to kind of point out one thing. Um, technology is progressing at a exponential you know, speed, and as a result, what we consider as mobile devices, really cool, high-end, really fast mobile devices, in five years, you look back and you go like, ooh, what is that? <laughs> okay, so just keep that in mind because you know things are moving at a really fast pace. Um, the one thing that I want you guys to also kind of think about is when 3D VR, virtual reality, becomes commonplace, okay? then you won't be walking around seeing people doing this all day long, you know, because Pokemon Go is, you know, kind of, people are still doing that, and you can bump into people like that. It's not gonna be like that. It's gonna be, you know, just, you know, something that looks like just regular glasses. It's not even gonna be a full, you know, goggle that looks obscure. It's gonna be something like this, and they will just be, you know, seeing either completely virtual reality or augmented reality, where something is superimposed to the actual stuff that is happening around, you know, these people. What are you going to do about clicking? Blink. You can, you can blink, but you have to blink anyway, so you're, you're, you're constantly <laughs> clicking, right? So that's not going to work. So what do you, how do you select an item when this is your interface? Yep. What about like the left background? Like when you raise it up, that's like a left <laughs> So only some people can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They've got a technology now. I saw on the TED TED uh, knows or whatever the TED Talks. TED Talks. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, the there's actually these little ring that you put on your finger, and they have control with the, the keyboard. So the virtual keyboard is anywhere you put your hand. So you don't even need the keyboard as long as you know your keypad. It memorizes. It allows uh, for a user interface, uh, oh, motion detect, so that if you do certain hand commands, yeah, yeah. it will automatically move your OS to whatever it is you're. I right. have to wear my uh, Lord of the Rings T-shirt on mm -hmm. Monday. <laughs> yes. um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yep, go ahead. Uh, something that they have already done with uh, patients who have. Uh, have suffered from uh, serious seizures and whatnot and can't move is they can implant a little chip inside their, their mind which allows them to interface with electronic devices. Now of course that's going to be a little bit, you have to worry a lot about security and there's work to be done and it's far from consumer level. However, the transhumanist future is now and it's coming soon so mm -hmm. that's, po that's potentially possible in like five years. 
can I self administer that? You know, can I like buy a kit and just inject a uh, chip well, in my it, head? It's possible that it can embed <laughs> that technology pretty soon. Comes because with a small drill bit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it doesn't even have to go like that. There's ways yeah. to access. Well, they can observe the outside too. Yeah. They they have a uh, devices they can just observe your activity, you know, from the outside. And yeah. It's crude at this point, but you know, but they do have those devices. Yeah, um, yeah they even have toys. You know, there's a toy. Um, I think it's based on the Star Wars thing. You know, you basically put a little helmet on, and you can control like things you know, a little bit. You said technology is moving at an exponential pace. Yep. Well, it, is. Yeah, it does. Yep. So I just want to put everything in context. Okay. So mobile devices, if you look at this slide here, okay, this is a lot of text, you know, which is really boring. So instead of talking about this, I am just going to point to, well, okay, you cannot see it, but there's a box down here, which is my desktop computer case. Okay, does anyone want me to kind of show a picture of a desktop computer case? Yes, let's do that. Okay, we'll just take a look at images, tons of these. Uh, we'll just take this picture here, which is fairly representative of what a desktop computer looks like. Okay, so when we talk about computers, people think of this. Okay, well, older people like myself think of this. Okay, but your cell phone is actually a computer. This is that pretending to be a phone. That's all <laughs> it's doing. Okay, phone is just an app. Otherwise, this is a computer, and it's more than that in many, many ways. Why do you think I said that? Yep. Because it's also a camera. That's not. Well, well a lot be. of laptops have built-in cameras now. Yep. Go ahead. Because of all the onboard sensing and devices that it has on the hardware that it has within it. Processor, yep. Exactly. Memory, Sensors. Sensor. Processor memory. Well, in terms of processing power and resources, that is still, you know, a lot better yep. compared to this for the same money. Yep. Go ahead. Oh. Um, more kind of, I guess, philosophical, but I tend to think of a phone as being more personalized. People are more personally attached to their mm -hmm. phone and their content in their phone than they might be toward a desktop computer. Okay, possibly. Yep. Uh, you can use the f a phone in places where a desktop computer has no business going. You can, so like, I, uh, you can use your phone on uh, for a variety of situations, and that makes uh, programming apps for a mobile phone. Uh, more versatile because these you can you, basically you can do location sensitive apps if like you want to take a picture of something and uh, you can't really do an app that's based around you can't do Pokemon Go on a mobile on a computer you can't do it on a mobile phone but that ties into what he said uh, as well you know because you know because a mobile device is so small well relatively small and you can just you know take it with you anywhere yeah. that opens up all kinds of possibilities because yeah. you don't have to wait until you get back home so they can sit in front of your computer. It's right here. Yeah. Okay, it's with you all the time. Okay, so I just kind of want to briefly go through the differences between that and a mobile device and a phone. Okay, uh, first of all, the input to these devices are completely different. Typical keyboard and a mouse. Okay, that's the input. You don't even see a microphone here or a webcam, okay? Now these days more and more you know, computer systems, especially those all in one time, you know, even though they're quote unquote desktop computers, they do come with mics and you know, cameras and stuff like that. But your phone has even more. It has a touch screen. Now you, you might see a lot of laptop computers with a touch screen too. You know, who would use a laptop computer and a touch screen? Graphic design. They have to flip it first, right? Because you know the ergonomics of doing it like this, where your hand is not rested on anything, that's not good. You can do this for a few, a few minutes, then you get tired. Okay. Um, this thing also has built-in speakers, built-in microphone, built-in GPS. Okay. Most computers, even laptop computers, don't have built-in GPS. There's no need for GPS in those cases. Um, this thing can connect to your cell phone service provider. Okay, now you can buy a little dongle and make a laptop computer connect to your uh, provider as well. Okay, but most of all, this is integrated. This is one little thing physically. That is multiple, multiple pieces and is clunky. Okay, are there any questions about this part? 
takes a battery. Hmm? It takes a battery. Oh, yeah. I mean, well. The only difference I can think of. Battery is always the, uh, the limiting factor of what we can do on mobile devices because unlike the electronics, which is actually going in an exponential rate in terms of progress, battery technology has not really progressed all that much. Now, I know lithium ion batteries and lithium polymer batteries are much better compared to lead acid battery, okay? But not to the same scale as the electronics in one of these devices versus something that's 20 years old. Yep. I think they might develop some kind of solar system for that. Solar. Solar charge system. Well, they have those, but you know the uh, efficiency of solar panels is not really even close to keeping these things you know powered up just using solar. You can help out a little bit, but it's not even close to what they need in order to run efficiently. So, so there is that. So getting back to here, you know, I'm just going to outline. You know, we have touch screen <coughs> built in. An app inventor can use the touch screen, especially in the canvas. Okay, so we'll talk about the canvas later on. Uh, cell phone radio. Okay, the you know, uh, app inventor can talk through your cell phone. You know, especially when it comes to texting. Three um, G, four G. You know, data. You know, connection. You know, that's kind of transparent to app inventor. GPS is available to app inventor. Bluetooth is available to app inventor. Wi-Fi is transparent to uh, App Inventor. It just hooks up to the network. Um, compass, which is the uh, orientation sensor, not orientation sensor, but compass, which is the direction sensor, is also available in App Inventor. Accelerometer is available in App Inventor. The mic speaker, it, to a certain extent, is available in App Inventor. You can do recording, you can play audio files, but you cannot open up an audio file and process the content of an audio file. Okay, so that's kind of a, eh, you know, if, if we could do that, it's really great, but you know, it's not something that App Inventor can easily do. Every semester that I teach this class, somebody wants to make a guitar tuner. <laughs> they want the, the app, you, they, will, they want you to play, you know, like one string, you know, on the guitar, and you know the app will tell you which way to turn the tuner. Uh, unfortunately, that's not possible, okay? Because you know there's no way to open up an audio file, look at the waveform, and process that in App Inventor. There's no easy way to do that, okay? So the next best thing you know that I told my students is pre-record a sound of a particular key. So play that sound when somebody is trying to tune a guitar. So hopefully, you know, this person will be able to know which way to turn the tuner so that the two sounds would match up. But that's the best we can do with App Inventor. So we have certain access to the camera and the microphone, but you know, if you want to do image processing, App Inventor is not the platform to do it. Yep. You said that we can use some uh, we can use some JavaScript. Yes. And uh, do yes. So uh, if we did want to do something like that, could we toss it into a JavaScript and uh, image processing library or machine learning library and do some stuff there? Um, JavaScript itself is not particularly efficient either I when know. it comes to image processing. So if someone really wants to do image processing and that sort of thing, I would do it in the cloud. In other words, you take a picture, you send a picture to a server, and then on the server, you can now write programs in C, C++, whatever you want, Python. do the processing, and then have it send back the result back to you. I think that's how Google does things too. You know, because you know, you know, if you think about Google goggles, you know, which takes a picture and analyze the hell out of the picture and tell you all kinds of stuff, you know, that's in the picture, it cannot possibly be done on the mobile device itself. It has to be done on a server somewhere else, like some massively powerful server. Yep. I mean, once you have the function from uh, your machine learning, you could just connect to the, you could just connect uh, there to kind of get the function. And but once you have that function, then it doesn't take particularly long to actually just run that mm. and figure out whether this well, in the scope of this class, you know, that's a little bit beyond, you know, the reach of most of us. <laughs> okay, so this is just an example, you know, for somebody who plays golf. You know, I don't golf. Okay, so you guys can tell me, oh, this is not what we do. Um, 
So we want to kind of think about, you know, okay, what kind of apps can we write and, you know, what do we do with mobile devices in, these, in this context? So the first thing is, you know, can you estimate the distance to a particular, how do you call those things, the flag thingy? Poles? Does anyone play golf? Nobody, yep. So how do you play, how do you call those things you know, that sticks out of the ground? Does a pole? That's, um, well, it marks the hole, right? Like it marks the, the hole, but so the height of this thing is fixed, or supposed to be fixed. This is standardized. So how do you call these things? Flag pole? Flag. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we'll just call it a flagpole, okay? You know, for the lack of a better term. Okay, but this height, the physical height of this thing is supposed to be fixed. Okay, it's supposed to be a particular length. I can, I can look it up right now. Six foot. Is it six? I believe so. Okay, so flag. Not that I don't trust you, but no. No, no, no. go for it. <laughs> In flags. Here, over on the right, there's an ad for it. Right. Yeah, see that right there, magazine flagpole. I get. I bet that the ad, like on the shopping website, it'll tell you Which how tall it is. Uh, just the very top, maxi flag pole with cup. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. That's not standardized. It's not standardized. According to, that's what, what? According to that guy's phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's say it is standardized. Okay. I think in, ter in official tournaments it is standardized. So let's say it's standardized. Now, once you know the properties of your phone's camera, like you know what is the um, the view angle, what is the resolution, and stuff like that. Now you can imagine somebody can actually you know take a picture of a black hole and then do the measurement of you know, the flagpole in the picture, and then use that as a ranging you know, mechanism to say, okay, I'm guesstimating you know, the distance from here to that flagpole is X amount of meters or yards, okay? Now, based on that information, the app can also automatically make a recommendation. Okay, I, might, I think you might want to use this particular club to drive the golf ball, you know, because that's the right, this, the right club for the distance. So you can have an assistance like that to kind of, you know, so that people can learn how to play, how to do the game without, you know, a companion, without a coach, and just go like, okay, I'm new, I just want to get the hang of this game, and an app can do that. Is that making any sense? Yep. Okay. Now I can also kind of imagine, you know, when the accelerometer technology is mature enough, you can attach a sensor to the end of a golf club or multiple sensors you know, throughout the golf club. So as you swing, the app is getting all the data back and analyze your swing and make recommendations and say, okay, you're swinging it too hard, too softly, your grip is too hard and so on and so forth because they can actually you know, tell nuances now you know, with high resolution sensors, they can actually do that. Is that making any sense? Sort of, okay. Now I'm talking about technology that may be a little bit beyond what we have at this point, but I would say give it five years and it's going to be commonplace. Okay, in five years you'll go to a your pro golf your club, you know, to play, and then the golf clubs will all be Bluetooth enabled. <laughs> they will talk to your phone. You might laugh now, okay, in five years, you know, come back to me and tell me this, that's not happening yet. You know, I, I think the only thing that I can be wrong is it will only take two years instead of five. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yep. Um, you can do wind compensation. So you can get the wind data from uh, a variety of sources. You know, the golf course itself may have a weather station. So you can tell the local wind direction right at that point. Um, you can have a little attachment on your phone that can do, you know, that can detect the you know, wind um, direction as well as you know the wind speed. Uh, I have those devices. Okay, it's for air gun competitions and stuff like that. It's just a little thing. It's actually wireless, but it attaches to your phone so that you don't have to hold that thing, you know, with your other hand. So those things are already here. 
okay, you know, a wing indicator, you know, that's you know, that is uh, that can communicate directly with your phone is already reality. You can also log, you know, how you go through a golf, you know, a game, um, you know, the location, you know, where you sent the ball, you know, and so on and so forth. So, and the last one is what I really want to point out is casting. An app that is running entirely on your phone can be very useful, can be great, okay? But the thing that we have now with mobile devices is it's also network connected. In other words, your app can connect to a cloud uh, resource. So this time, you know, so with, with uh, play casting, what you can do is you can have your friends, your relatives to follow you throughout your entire game. They can just you know, kind of use Google, you know, Google Maps and see where you are in the golf course and how you're scoring and stuff like that. And they can you know, text you, you know, and say, go tech, go, you know. <laughs> 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 Sorry? The new miss while reading text. <laughs> yeah, well, they, but, but it's, it's a social thing, okay? You know, I think what people found um, to be particularly useful about computers, or the main difference between people in my generation of using a computer and how my kids use their computer is the social aspect. When I play a video game, back in the days when I played a lot of video games, it's stand alone. Okay, it's standalone, I'm playing the video game, I'm not interacting with other people whatsoever. Okay? But these days, you know, my kids, you know, the video games is just like you know, going outside playing basketball with their friends. It's all about this social aspect that make it fun. It's not really the game itself that is fun. It's playing with the buddies and trying to do things together in the game. That is what makes it fun. Okay? And your cell phone is perfect for that sort of thing because it already has network connection, it has a microphone, it has a camera, it, and in App Inventor, it also has all kinds of mechanisms to connect to Twitter, okay, and uh, texting and stuff like that, so you can actually use your app to stay connected with other people while doing whatever the app is supposed to do. And is, uh, is Pokemon Go one of the first uh, computerized games that gets people or kids I'll outside go outside? No, I think there's a game prior to that, and that's how they set up the the Poke Stops and the Pokemon uh, Gyms. Ingress. Yes. Ingress? Okay. But that was never really quite as popular as uh -huh. Pokemon Go. No. Was that no, really no, no, no. Nothing is as popular as Pokemon Go. Right. Okay, <laughs> and then explain this. Why is Pokemon Go still so buggy? <laughs> because it was made on the, as a clone of an older, less popular program. <laughs> and they don't have any servers. They don't have any source code anymore. <laughs> it's running in emulation. <laughs> uh, yep. The thing is that uh, Pokemon, Pokemon Go uh, had demand that far outstripped what their server capacity could hold, which was also true of World of Warcraft, but was tri triply true of Pokemon Go, since it far outpaced uh, any of the Pokemon console games, as mm -hmm. well as any previous uh, AR games. So the thing is that uh, the server, the thing is though that Pokemon Go didn't need to be perfect. It didn't need to have a lot of features because it had both the branding and the, and then the community to kind of keep it alive and keep it kicking even though it did, even though it did not have all of the, those other features that you would like, so. Well, having to restart the game every 10 minutes is a pain. Yeah. The real phenomenon is it's this buggy, but everyone is still playing it. Yep, everybody, well, a lot of people have kind of moved I've on, you know, once they get past like level 23, level 24, yeah. there's no there's no point in playing much anymore. Yeah. There's like at least, well, I can think of at least five things that they, they can do to just get bumps uh, at second generation Pokemon, at third generation Pokemon, at fourth generation Pokemon, <laughs> at fifth generation Pokemon, and at Kalos and Alola Pokemon. I have a question. Has anybody played around with the maps that are available? Okay. To yes. expose all of the, oh. on GitHub, there's a source code for, for PC, Mac, desktop app, along with a few other that you deploy on uh, 
Where's the fun in that? So they show you the location of the Pokemon. And stops and uh, gyms. Well, the and stops and gyms are easy, yeah, but the, the Pokemon But it shows the Pokemon. Is the I have it, and you can fire it up. Is it accurate? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah and then you use uh, an emulator called Nox, and you download the, the game and put it on a Nox, and you can actually run around <laughs> and just, yeah, like New York's yeah. the best area. I've caught Pokemon on top of the the pyramids in Giza, and like just all over the place. But don't use your real account, they're banning now. Yeah. <laughs> I just had two really good accounts banned. I'm oh. done, I'm done with both of them now. <laughs> <laughs> so they took me out, I have to two level like 26s. And if you want to dispatch Pokemon with, and with that while sitting at your computer, why don't you just play the actual console game? Yeah. Well, I mean, the part of it is, you know, you know, we, we have the hacking mentality. We just have the, you know, it's not really for the game itself. It's just to satisfy the curiosity. Can this be done? Can I do this to kind of hack the game? You know, that's the hacking mentality. Um, but Pokemon Go is a very good example of utilizing a lot of the devices that are available on a Pokemon phone. I mean, not. <laughs> on, a, on a cell phone, okay? Because especially when you turn on the AR, the augmented reality, you, you just superimpose a Pokemon in front of you. And it does a fairly good job at it, you know, when you move your phone left, right, up and down, you know, the Pokemon kind of stays at the same place, you know, it appears to stay at the same place. So they, they did a pretty good job, you know, with you know, the augmented reality thing. Yep. Uh, what was the ma first mainstream company to come out with augmentation? Would it be Yelp with the monocle about five years ago? Um, yeah, it's something about uh, shopping. So when you hold up your phone, it will it will start to put the like pens where you know, shops, restaurants, and whatnot are located. Yep. But I don't think it's Yelp. You know, at the time it was some other, it has some other name, but Yelp may, might have acquired that company. Uh, yep. Augmented reality has been around for 30, 40 years at this point, uh, but probably the most it was uh, successful uses of augmented reality have been there's this one app which is made for the blind and uh, and it uses Amazon's Mechanical Turk but it basically lets you just point your phone at where you're trying to see and and uh, then it'll have yeah. you give you the information via it'll describe headphones. what the phone is seeing yes yeah yeah I, I've heard of that app as well it's really cool yep but it's not how much time something has been around, it is how commonplace and how most people can have access to it, right? Rockets have been around for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't have one. <laughs> Give you a lot of money and she'll make you one. Well, if you think about it, you know, this is the second piece that really makes the mobile apps really, really useful is the cloud, okay? You know, I talked about it a little bit. Uh, Pokemon Go is a very good example of how a mobile app that is very interactive, but the real value has to do with the cloud. Because Pokemon Go cannot work without internet connection, without the cloud. Okay? So the cloud gives you the ability to utilize um, massive amount of computation resources that is not available on your phone. Um, does anyone have, uh, what is the name of that thing? Wolfram, Wolfram 1. It's a math uh, package. Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. Wolfram Alpha. Okay. Because I don't use it very often, but it's a it's a really cool thing. You can just ask it. Okay. When is the next full moon? Okay. It will do the computation, show you the orbit of the moon around the Earth, blah blah blah. You know the whole thing. Now you can ask it. You know how long it will take for to drive to the moon, assuming a certain speed. It understands natural language. Okay, so you can answer the question. But if you ask it something difficult, it can actually show you the derivation of equations and stuff like that. That's also based on the cloud, because there's no way they can fit the AI engine in the phone itself. So the phone <laughs> is nothing more than just a dumb terminal to take in the query, display the result, and that's about it. So the cloud is really useful for that purpose. And for anything that's social, okay, the cloud is also useful. Because once you put some information into the cloud, then you have all kinds of mechanisms to share that information with other people. Are we doing okay so far with this? Now, this is also the time when I need to kind of show you a, my tile, okay? 
it's, it, this is a tile, okay? If you have, have not, you know, if you have, don't know what a tile is, you know, just go to, um, I think the company is <coughs> based in San Francisco, but if you just type tile, it will get you to the official website. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So this is one of those, you know, silly devices, you know, the concept has been around for a long time, okay? You attach something to a key ring, and then, you know, there are some ways to trigger this thing to ring, so that you know, oh, okay, it's under the bed, under the pillow, it's in the bathroom, and so on and so forth. It's, it's for you to locate stuff that you typically would misplace at home. So I have this one on my keychain, because I tend to misplace my keychain. So the concept has been around for a long, long time, and there has been numerous you know, products that do about the same thing. Now, with this one, it's, first of all, it's a two-way kind of thing. In other words, I can go to my phone and say, hey, locate this particular keychain. It will beep it. Okay, let me just do that as an, as an illustration. So I have to go find my tile app first, tile. And then you, you can have any number of tiles, okay, and it will, it will just go ahead and locate each tile individually. And let me see if I can locate this one. How long do you have that? Tile. This tile, probably about a year or so. You know, I right. Hmm? Any problem with the battery on the tile nope. itself? You have to. Nope. No. Well, I guess I haven't lost it too often, so it hasn't been taking up the, using the juice too often. So one way to use it is to use a phone to locate the tile. You just say, okay, I want to locate a tile that is linked to my car keys. Okay, click that button, it rings, right? The other thing you can do is it will locate the phone. So sometimes I find a key, but then I lost my phone, right? So you can double click on the button, which is the E on the tile, okay, double click it. Now my phone says, okay, I'm here. Do you carry as a Bluetooth device? Is that what it's for? Yep. yep. What if yep. you can't find either? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can have multiple yeah. tiles, <laughs> and they can all help you locate your phone. Where, where one is an earring, see? <laughs> <laughs> now, but the best thing about this, now so far what I have demonstrated has nothing to do with the cloud at all, because it's, all, it's just, it just relies on Bluetooth technology um, to help you find the item. But it also has a cloud function. Yeah, go ahead. How far apart is the radius that the um, from what I have seen, it's about maybe 30 feet or so, so it's not really that much. Uh, so you have to walk around a little bit before you can start to sense and go, like, okay, I have located it into within 30 feet, then you have to walk around a little bit more. It, but it will beat the other device, so it will help you locate it by the sound. That's the same um, footprint then as a normal Bluetooth would be? Yes. So we are working off whatever Bluetooth power footprint you have that be available. Well, it's Bluetooth 4.0, which is a low power standard, um, so it can last a little bit longer. Okay, but so far I have only shown you, you know, the technology, the Bluetooth part, and just something that you can do with, with an app. Okay, but it also has a cloud component. Okay, they they have that in the video too. So when you on your own time, you can watch the video. Um, you can attach this to a bicycle under the seat. Okay, so somebody's gonna say, well. How would how can somebody lose a bicycle? Well, you can it can be stolen. Okay, so when a bike is stolen, it is most likely to be way too far from your cell phone to locate it. So what you do is you go you go to your app and you declare the item lost. Okay, and what that will do is send a message to the mothership, the cloud, and the cloud would then you know, classify and say, okay, this particular ID is declared lost. And then it will send a message to all the installations of the tile app and say, look for this thing. Uh, so if somebody is running the tile app, just so happens to walk around and, you know, and be close enough to pick up the actual tile that is lost, then it will use the GPS and, and say, I found that thing here. Hmm. <laughs> and then the cloud would then return a message back to you and say, yes, we have found your lost item. It is currently located here. So you call the cops. <laughs> I wouldn't go there personally. I would call the cops. 
and say, okay, well, we'll the cops will go there, and then you just stay at a distance, make sure everything is good before you know, approaching the, the, the location. But then you have to explain the cloud to the cops. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just tell them that you have found your item over there. <laughs> that's all you need to say. Um, but that's it. You know, that's how the cloud can really help enhance the value of apps. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. The idea is, you know, the cloud should be so integrated into your apps. If someone were, were to drop a cell phone onto a driveway and roll over with a car and completely destroy the phone, it should be a very simple and easy process to get the next phone and get everything back. Because you know most of the stuff, configuration, settings, and stuff like that, preferences, should also be stored in the cloud. So in the event of the device getting lost, getting trashed, just get a new device, everything should be back with like just pressing a button. That would be ideal. Not quite there yet, you know, but getting there. Yep. Ideal for whom? Because uh, when you're sh sh shooting off all your information to the cloud, mm -hmm. what you're kind of doing is you're giving up uh, uh, control. You're giving up control over your <coughs> data. And so, like, what if governments who, dude, let's face it, it uh, will regulate this technology, will regulate companies. If governments have access to that data, then if say you were trying to run, go to an anarchist rally, mm -hmm. then they might uh, use such data to profile you as a domestic terrorist and whatnot. Well, based on what I teach and how I teach, they probably already did that. <laughs> they have already done it. <laughs> Classify me as a domestic terrorist. <laughs> That's what Tor is. I for. teach hacking in my classes and stuff like that. So, but to, to answer to address your point, okay. Um, there's nothing really, you know, the, the government can get to your content on your phone if they have physically have access to your phone. They can probably get to the content also. You know, you guys remember the Apple thing, you know, with the iPhone from that guy in the uh, San Bernardino shooting thing? Um, so, you know, so unless you encrypt everything, you know, using a particular encryption algorithm that the government has no access to, you know, I, I mean, that's why, why as app designers, we should like make sure that the type of information that we get can't really be, should be in the control of the user, or, or should, or if we do take it, should not be able to be used against the user. We need to take caution for that as app designers, so that we don't have like, like uh, our apps used to enforce social control. Well, but in order to do, the, to do that, you have to trust at least the operating system. You have to trust Android not having any backdoors. <laughs> now, yeah. Android is easier because it can, be cr it can be recompiled. So people have access to the source code so that they can go through the source code, make sure there's no backdoor, and then recompile the code, right? What about <laughs> iOS? Who has the source code of iOS? It's a closed system. So it's a closed system, exactly. Use it. Exactly. So if iOS itself cannot be trusted, then all bets are off. The moment you save something onto your hard drive, who's going to guarantee that not a copy is going to be sent to Apple for backup purposes, right? <laughs> Quality assurance. Quality assurance, yes. This call will be recorded, yes. <laughs> So I think you know to a certain extent you know what you said is that your concern is true. Okay, I can understand why you know that would be a real concern, but at the same time, for the average person, um, the <coughs> amount the amount of work that you have to do to ensure that level of privacy is painful. <laughs> Most people would not do that. Well, then you have to make your own, you know, device, have your own operating system, and have your own cloud service. Then you, then everything is yeah. under your control. Yeah, but obviously, <laughs> you have to make compromises. I'm just saying that yep. be aware of the compromises you're making. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Well, that's a that's that's good advice. Well, we all know about the uh, presiden presidential candidate issues, right? The email server and stuff like that. Yeah. Well. 
you know, if they can hire people to crack that. <laughs> now, it's high value in that case, okay? So it does have some value. All right, so um, the other thing about, you know, something being cloud-based is it's easier to update because the app itself doesn't really do a whole lot. Most of the logic is on the server itself. So once you update the software on the server, you know, it's not like, you know, you have 20 million, you know, end users who also have to update their apps. Because one update on the server side already updates the work, you know, most of the work to be done. So now you don't have to have to deal with a lot of end users trying to upgrade and they cannot and the versions don't match and stuff like that. So, you know, a cloud, the cloud-based approach also has that advantage. So the downside of cloud-based apps is the reliance on networking. Now some apps can be cloud-based when the cloud is available. I think Google Apps, you know, or Google Document Apps on phones you know, can work without the cloud. I can be wrong here, but that's nice because you know, that means if you don't have internet access, you will still be able to work on your documents. It's just that it won't get synced until you know, network connection is re-established. Um, Network security is really important in this case because if network uh, security on the cloud side, not on your phone side, but on the cloud side is lax, then people can just hack into the cloud, you know, the server, and be able to get all sorts of in, uh, data from the, from the cloud. It's concentrated. They don't have to hack individual devices anymore. They just have to hack one single point, which is the cloud server, and then they can get all the data. Uh, privacy and security responsibility is no longer, is going to be pushed back to the uh, app service provider. So the end <coughs> user is really just, okay, here's my username, here's my password, sign in, that's it. The data availability and reliability is also pushed to the app service provider. If a server goes down, then you end up with massive number of people without you know, access to an application, and that can be bad. Um, the complexity of the software is increased due to the server client model. It's not really that big of a deal, okay? But this can be remedied by <laughs> proper abstraction of the server client interaction. That's way beyond the scope of this class. I'm just, you know, kind of putting this out here for those of you who eventually want to consider cloud-based uh, apps. So are there any questions about this particular slide? The importance of the cloud in the context of mobile apps. Yep. In order to be cloud, like to define it as a cloud app, does it have to connect to a virtual private server, or can it be a normal you know, just web server, and that would be considered cloud? That's process? a good question. So the question is, you know, how do we define the word cloud in you know, in the context of you know uh, information communication uh, technology <coughs> or apps? So the term cloud is defined up here. Usually, it, can, it, in, it includes the use of virtual servers, you know, virtual machines as servers. In other words, you don't really quite know where the hardware platform is hosted, or which computer within the facility is going to be hosting your quote unquote server because it's all virtualized. So, cloud does have that implication. It's not spelled out, but it has that implication. It also has an implication of redundancy which basically means if one server goes down, your surface is not going down because your virtual server can migrate from one computer to another computer. It also implies remote storage. Sometimes your know, cloud is really just about storing stuff online. And in many cases, you know, it also implies the use of clustering. Now that's way out of the context of this class, but clustering is basically the ability to scale the performance of a server up by saying, okay, if I'm just starting out, I'm gonna use like two or three computers, but you know, when I start to get a lot more customers, the same app on the server side can now split its tasks onto like 200 computers, and you don't have to change the source code, it's just scaling up very well as you increase the number of computers to the, to the, to the cluster. So cloud has these implications even though not a single one is quote unquote a requirement to be classified as a cloud resource. So the physical hardware has nothing to do with the deal the term at all? Physical hardware, you know, that's the whole point of cloud because you know it's not it's I'm talking about the server hardware. 
the server the hardware. Server yeah, if, if you use the word cloud, it's typically virtualized, that you don't have access or you don't know the actual physical box that's running it. Okay. You know, because otherwise it's just a, a web server. You know, yeah. That's yeah, a generic yeah. term. But when you use the word cloud, it implies that it is virtualized. But even though it's a web server, like the way my planner is still running a virtual machine, they still have redundancy, they still have remote storage, mm -hmm. and clustering, I spin up another image whenever my traffic gets too high of right. whatever it's on. So, but I'm not, I'm not a virtual private server. I'm actually on servers that are in uh, Wisconsin. And, okay. You know, like so, but they're not a really a cloud-based application. They're Apache. Well, you know, Apache is just the, the web server program running on a particular server computer, but it, it can still be a part of the cloud, okay. so especially if your work. server can migrate from one physical box to another physical box. Yeah. You know, that, that answers my question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, you know, I would encourage you to take a look at at least one product. I'm not promoting and say this is the only product you should be using it, but the one that I know of is uh, the Amazon Web service or w -I -A -W -S. so look it up and um, and just read about it okay you know there's no need to buy anything just read the documentation about this so AWS is a way for you to basically come up with a virtual machine image and upload it to AWS so anytime you want to start a, a server to work you just you know use the web interface and say okay I want to fire this up okay and then you can you can also specify how much resources to give to the virtual server. You can say, okay, I only need about two gigs of RAM and the performance of a you know an i5 processor, dual core, um, and you know, four, tw 40 gigs of hard drive space, and so on and so forth. So you can you can control the cost of your server by you know using all of those parameters. They also charge by how much you are actually using and you know, in terms of bandwidth and stuff like that. So it's scalable. They're not charging off the virtual space, they're charging off actual usage. Um, on certain things. On bandwidth, they are charging you based on how much you are actually using, but in terms of RAM, it's charging how much you are allocating. Okay. So if you, can, you, if you allocate like 64 gigs of RAM and you're only using four, they will still be charging you for 64 yeah. Yeah. because on the actual hardware, you are taking up that much resources so that other virtual machines do not have that resource anymore. So you can also they can also guarantee you know x amount of processing power and stuff like that. Um, so if you configure a really high end virtual server, that can rack you up to like thousands of dollars per hour. But that's like peanuts, okay? Because the alternative of having to purchase a supercomputer with that type of processing power will run you hundreds of thousands of dollars easily. And then the personnel to maintain that and stuff like that. So if you have to spend like three thousand dollars to have the capability of a supercomputer for an hour, that's a bargain. Okay. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, you'll look up your know, AWS, and I think there are many other companies offering similar services. Um, but a lot of companies are on AWS already as we speak. Um, in about two years of time. This campus, this entire district, will not use D2L anymore. Now, D2L is hosted in the district itself. Okay, the servers, the physical servers, are in the district office. When they move on to Canvas, which is the alternative that is going to replace D2L, is running on AWS. So they can scale up the performance easily. They just you know say, okay, we now need you know 16 cores instead of four. Okay. We need uh, 64 gigs of RAM instead of 32. They would, they would charge you more, but then you know you don't have to you don't have to do anything to reconfigure your app. Maybe shut down and start again. Yep. Go ahead. What are, how does it cost? Um, are they competitive or? I think they're competitive. You know, anything that Amazon does, you know, has to be fairly competitive, if not the most efficient or cost-effective way. You know, um, I have checked it out. You can even get free accounts. The way they do the free accounts is, you know, it's kind of limited in terms of resources, and they basically use spare resources and give those away as free. In other words, you know, they have to have a certain number of servers just to uh, service, just to provide service to the pay to the paying customers, right? But to have those hardware, you know, running around, 
there will be surplus ca capacity where, okay, you know, at this time, nobody is using anything. So they offer up you know, the resources as free resources to people who just want to sign up, give it a try, and stuff like that. So it's a really smart use of resources because it's available anyway. It's kind of like surplus electricity because generators cannot stop. Okay, If you stop a generator, it's going to cost like a massive amount of time and money to restart them. So they had to keep the generator going overnight, even though during nighttime, you know, the consumption of electricity is really low. So you have all this electricity that is flowing around, but nobody is using it. And that's why they charge you less money at night for electricity, because it's quote unquote surplus. It's just there, nobody's using it, you know. So they want to lower the lower the, the amount of money so that more people can kind of shift their uh, electrical use during uh, the nighttime, like to recharge your Tesla and stuff like that. Yep. <laughs> so is this basically, from the user's perspective, a server that they can just install whatever on? Is that what they're seeing that the users have? So the way to use this is you can either use standardized um, images of free operating systems. So they cannot give you Windows because Windows is licensed. But if you, let's say you want a, a, a typical regular box that's running Ubuntu. Okay? So they have their own images and you can just say, okay, fire one up, I want to use it now. But if you have your own customized uh, image of Linux, FreeBSD, or whatever, you can upload your image okay? you know, that has everything pre-installed. It's just a hard drive image. You can upload that to AWS and say, okay, run it now. And, so, and your own software as well. So, so it's, your it's all your software. Your operating system, your choice of operating system, everything is pre-installed by you onto a virtual hard drive file. So what you're uploading is really the drive. So basically you're uploading a machine that you have already configured. Okay. And then they can just run it on the other side and say, okay, how much resource do you want to use uh, or allocate to this machine. You can say, okay, I want you know, 32 gigs of RAM, I want a quad-core processing uh, processor performance, and blah, 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 you know, and they would just, okay, <coughs> they would throw all the resources to your virtual machine, start it up, and it's yours. Okay. Yep. So that kind of ties into what, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, you, if you need a network interface, they can give you an IP address. Um, I think they can give you static IP as well if you pay extra money. So every time you start up the machine, it's going to have the same IP address. So you can park your website on AWS because it can have a fixed IP address. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people do uh, you know, borderline legal stuff with their virtual machines and they choose to use, of course, you know, dynamic IP. So every time they start up the virtual machine, it has a different IP address. <laughs> and they only needed to run it like five minutes and shut it down. <laughs> borderline legal? Borderline legal, yeah, that's what oh, I said. Legal. Yeah, borderline legal. Gray stuff, not black, but not definitely not white either. <laughs> All righty. So are there any further questions, comments about, you know, the cloud in the context of mobile apps? Questions? Yep. So you could use their RAM through the cloud or something? So like you could run like a PC quality game on your phone? I mean, you mean in the context of the cloud? Yeah. Probably so not because... Okay, it's possible, but I'm not really sure how practical it is. Okay, so when you start up a virtual machine on the cloud in the cloud, it can run a full GUI, you know, so you can you can base if you have the license to run Windows, okay, you can run a Windows machine completely in the cloud. So there's no actual graphics card, there's no display associated with it. It's all virtual, right? But the virtual machine console, you know, on the other end can display whatever is supposed to be displayed on the virtual machine. That is possible. Technically it is possible. The question is, do you have the bandwidth to update the screen of your phone fast enough that you can actually play games? That becomes the limiting factor. But in theory, given the amount of you know, uh, network speed, networking speed that you need, it is possible. So it's possible that you can run CSGO on a virtual server remotely, have tons of resources you know, thrown at it. The, the bottom line is, can 
the virtual machine update your screen fast enough through your network connection. That becomes the bottom one. The, that becomes the, the, the threshold, the bottom one. Sorry? Well, it's all about bandwidth. It's all about you know how much network you know speed do you have. All right. So this is done. We are moving on to the next topic. All right. So I'm going to back to go back to the golf uh, app here. And basically, just you know, to this part just explains you know how you know, being in the cloud can be helpful. Now, in the context, you know, when I wrote this in 2013, Pokemon Go was not available. <laughs> okay, but you can kind of imagine with a golf game, you can now have a virtual golf game where you can just play, swing, and keep score anywhere you go on the ARC campus. You'll start to see people doing this. Cell phone. Okay, I need to go there because the ball just you know, flew over there. Yep. That's entirely possible. They can you can even have like you no know, little plastic sticks as a golf club, you know, with um, uh, a solar meter, you know, built into those things. So this way you can actually swing something, and the, the phone will register and actually you can play golf, you know, anywhere you go, you know, on campus, off campus, in any like parking the, lot. Huh? Kind of like the uh, old game station Wii, yeah. the way that they had uh, sensors with. Uh, yeah, yeah, the remote. But this is going to be high resolution. Um, Google is actually experimenting with high resolution and high accuracy uh, accelerometer. They are accurate enough that they can keep track of your location with very, very good accuracy. In other words, turn off the GPS, turn off anything that is positional, you know, and only turn on your accelerometer. So you basically push a button. And, and, and your app still needs a map, okay, so that it knows you know, the configuration of your surrounding. So you, you push a button, you go out, you run around, you come back, and you push another button. And the app can tell you you have the same location without using GPS. Because what it's doing is measuring all the acceleration and deceleration in 3D. And by using that data and using physics, because acceleration, if you integrate acceleration, it becomes uh, velocity, when you integrate velocity, it becomes distance. So by using the math, it can calculate you know, your current location relative to the quote-unquote home position. Now, you, if you use an app, I mean, excuse me, if you use a phone, like a common you know, Nexus 5 phone today, to try to do the same thing, it won't tell you that you're at the same location because it doesn't have the resolution or the sampling frequency that is needed to get this done. So Google is already experimenting with the hardware, the semiconductor stuff, to make it a reality. So this way, you know, once you can confirm you're at exactly that location by tracking the accelerometer um, data, you can now have high resolution data of where you are currently at. So that's that's going to be helpful inside the mall because you know exactly which store is right next to you. Then Google, Google can pop up the right app. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a 40% discount on this item in the store. Walk two steps and then make a left turn. Yes, that's the right rack. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Five years, okay? And again, you know, in five years, you know, your app can tell you, you know, how to shop inside a store okay it's not just yes you are now at the store blah 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 it's like okay I need to find a dress like this or I need to find a pair of socks like that it would tell you exactly where to go in steps <laughs> so there goes the privacy because you know Google knows exactly where you are <laughs> it's not privacy for the sake of privacy it's just privacy for the sake of political uh, security yeah, well, you know, political stuff is, is political stuff. All right, so this slide is interesting because given the amount of time that we have left, we do have something to do in the lab, okay? We have one homework assignment and most of you can probably get it done within 10, 15 minutes at the most at the lab. So we do have something to do at the lab. This part is for people who want to start programming right away 
they go like, I have an idea, I want to start coding right away, okay? Well, that's good because it shows enthusiasm, but at the same time, it can lead to some problems as well. So this is really just talking about all the uh, stuff that you need here. But I want to kind of give you a little preview of what is in the next section. It talks about you know, why you should not jump into programming right away. So I will just kind of ask some of you, why is this not a bad idea? Not a good idea. Why is it a bad idea to start programming as soon as you have an idea of an app? Well, okay, it's not planned out, okay? Yep. By laying your idea out, you're able to incorporate in all the features and other things so that you're not having to go back and uh, redesign areas that you've already designed. It's really a time saver factor more than, I mean, for me, mm -hmm. of laying your idea out is that you get more complete, oh, this is, I have to include this. And if you do that after you've built out A, B, and C, typically you're going back and having to re-engineer stuff to make it work. Okay. Set up development. Okay. The difference between uh, programming and software engineering is that in engineering, what you do is you design. So the reason that you put out a design is so that at uh, essentially when you write each function, you should not have to think about it. It should, each function should be short. Each function should only contain one idea. You should be able to set everything up, modularize uh, things, and make sure that. And there's no thinking at all. All the thinking should be done in the design stage because otherwise... Designing, planning, right. engineering. Okay, yeah. so very good. So let, let, let me give you an example, an analogy of, you know, going about doing something without planning and, you know, the proper way of doing things. So let's just say that we, this is of course in my dream, okay? Somebody gave me a property on Highway 1 where it's a nice view. I have the mountain to my back, you know, the Pacific Ocean to my front. You know, it's close to a beach within walking distance and blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's really cool. Just a property, no structure, no houses, no building whatsoever. So, and then I'm also given an unlimited amount of money to build a house, okay? What am I gonna do next? I am going to get my truck, go to Home Depot, buy a whole bunch of stuff and then start building the house. <laughs> Why not? You don't know how to build a house. Sorry? You don't know how to build a house. You don't know how to do the foundation. Fine, I will, I will hire contractors right away. I, I know buddies who are contractors, so I just say, hey, you know, Timmy, come on over here. I want you to build me the best house on this property. And what is Timmy gonna ask? Have you been to <laughs> where's the Where's the what? Blueprint, very good, okay? Because contractors want to have a blueprint to start to build anything. What is a blueprint? Plan. The whole plan, the design, the specification, right? Down to the details of where the switches are located, the faucet, the material possibly of the countertop and stuff like that, right? If not for that, at least the dimension of everything, right? The rooms, the roof and all the other stuff. And who's in charge of that? The contractor said, I'm not gonna touch that. Okay, give me the blueprint or I cannot start working, period. The architect and the civil engineer, okay? The architect is the person who's designing the structure, okay? But the engineer has to analyze, okay, is the soil type good enough to have this built here? Um, do we have enough support for this, you know, really big arc, you know, at the entrance of this building and stuff like that? So we do have, you know, those people involved in order to build a building. To jump in coding into coding just because you have an idea of what something that you want to do is like driving to Home Depot, pick up some hardware, pick up some wood, lumber, and stuff like that, and start building without a blueprint. <laughs> okay, so you might build something, okay, that resembles a house, and then you might realize, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Where's the kitchen? <laughs> Okay, so we'll continue this discussion on next Monday, but at this point, you know, uh, you guys have a short break, about 10 minutes. We'll move over to the lab and then we'll do a little bit of app, you know, it's a, your homework assignment. So we'll go ahead and do it over there.
and I'm going to stop the recorder, upload it.